recording. Welcome in everyone. Welcome today. Please get settled in and welcome to Tuesdays and Thursdays with Care Patrol. We're so glad you're here with us today. I hope today's information is valuable and instructive for you. For some of you, it may help in your practice. For others, it may not, but it may be information you can use in your personal lives. And I hope that's the case. So thank you to everyone for being here. I hope you're enjoying our series thus far since uh, I've taken over as the program director and uh, main presenter, although I have some others coming up uh, in April that I'm excited about. Uh, so I hope everyone's enjoying them. And if so, please tell your colleagues, folks down the hall or in the desk next to you in the space near you to uh, tune in as well. Uh, if they need CEUs or just uh, would enjoy the information. So please continue to, uh, to uh, reach out to folks and have them join us. We'd love to have as many people on here as we can. We can actually take 500. So we're a little bit shy of that today, but happy that you all are here. Um, today we're discussing the hospice doula, and we'll get more into that uh, momentarily, what that means, what the word doula means, uh, and how that may apply to hospice. Uh, and I am considering this an East meets West sort of approach because of uh, just the approach to death and dying that is sort of worldwide and in the literature uh, seems to have culminated in a modern approach or a scientific approach, let's say, to hospice. And I think that's so interesting that, and it so happens so often when Eastern mysticism and something like physics maybe combine and, and you understand that, that something that was held to be true actually proves to be true using data and statistics and numbers. So that to me is interesting. And uh, I'm hoping that you'll find it interesting as we get further into today's discussion. We'll let some more people gather in. I know we have people joining by phone and otherwise. If you're joining by phone, uh, your phone is on mute or you're muted. Uh, I'm sorry about that. If you need to ask a question, maybe text me directly uh, and ask that question. My number, my cell, if anyone needs to text during the presentation, is 205-482-8759. And that's also the number you can get uh, me uh, on the phone uh, when, uh, you know, you have a referral. So keep that cell number handy. Again, we're admitting folks in today. We have 44 people now in attendance and uh, still admitting others. So thank you. And those of you just joining, welcome to Tuesdays and Thursdays with Care Patrol. It's Tuesday, March 3rd. Thank you so much for joining us in March. It's a beautiful day here in Birmingham where I am. I hope it's a beautiful day where you are. Um, it is just glorious and the weather is superb. And I'm convinced we're gonna get snow before the end of the month. It always happens in March. So we'll see if I'm right. Uh, but today you wouldn't know it, it's uh, spring. Uh, and we, you know, we so rarely have spring in the South that today is particularly enjoyable. So I hope it's beautiful where you are. I hope you're settled in. You have your lunch in front of you, your snack or whatever you need to finish up working on. And uh, you're ready for today's teaching. We'll be beginning here shortly. We're still admitting folks, uh, but we're talking about the hospice doula and East meets West. This is part one of a two-part uh, presentation. We'll have the follow-up on Tuesday of next week, the 8th of March, where we'll discuss the hospice doula, East meets West, part two. And I hope that some of you uh, may be excited by the prospect of doing a, a meditation, learning to meditate and do a guided meditation next week. So. My hope is that we'll have a lot of people tune in just because I think that, uh, you know, having that little break in the day at lunch will be invigorating for folks. Um, oh, I'm glad it's pretty enough. The city of opportunity. 
I'm glad it's beautiful there. It is gorgeous and glorious here. It's uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays with Care Patrol. It's uh, 12.05. I'm sure we have folks still, uh, still wanting to admit, and we'll admit people until 12.20. But I'll get started with uh, getting us deeper into the information. Uh, housekeeping, we like to start with, uh, obviously. Uh, your phones are muted. Uh, if you need to ask a question or share a piece of information or you want to share a resource with one of your colleagues on the on the line here, I hope you will. I hope you will use the chat room as a way to share uh, resources with one another and share ideas as well as ask questions. And again, if you're uh, on the phone, I don't know if you can text and call, but my, my number is 205-482-8759. You can always uh, text me a question during the presentation or later if you have one. Um, questions are certainly can be asked through the chat room. As you know, uh, the Board of Social Work and the Board of Nursing uh, require us to be present for at least 40 minutes of the 55 minutes of the CEU. Therefore, at 12.20, we cut off the presentation. If you fall off and come back in, and I, I recognize your name, I'll let you back in. If not, I, if I don't, and I might not, I apologize, then I, I won't be able to let you back in after 12.20. Uh, and I think in terms of calling in, I think that's something you can continue to call in without, without issue, I believe. Um, in order to get your certificate, uh, you need to complete an evaluation. And to do that, uh, you need to use SurveyMonkey. SurveyMonkey is a, a collection tool, an evaluation tool that we use. And you need to answer certain questions about the presentation so that we can improve uh, and so that we can prove that you were here. Now, to get to SurveyMonkey, uh, for those of you on the phone, I will repeat the address now. Uh, and again, at the end of the presentation, for you to go to after the presentation to complete your survey. And that is, the, the website is, if you're ready, the website is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash uppercase z z q b six k d so that's https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash uppercase Z, Z, Q, B as in boy, six, K, D as in David. Uh, and you'll go there at the conclusion of today's presentation, complete your survey by five o'clock today, and I'll have those turned around and mailed out as paper certificates in digital form to nurses and social workers. Now, the participation code word must be included, and we'll be giving that code word later in today's presentation for those of you who, uh, well, all of you will need it to, in order to unlock the survey, um, in order to also fill in the required field in the survey. So the code word and the password are the same thing, and that will be later in the presentation. And again, we do it later to prove that you were here for the 40 minutes. Um, so if you have any referrals of folks who need guidance, which is free, or uh, options explained, which is free, or need to understand why Medicare won't pay for care or any other questions, we're happy to educate and advocate and help people along in their journey. And then occasionally we also are able to help them find a community and that's how we earn a living. We earn a living when people who use our service, move into a community, the community pays us a fee. So the, the family never pays us, the community pays us, and we do a lot of work where we're never paid because they never move uh, or can't move or something else. But nonetheless, 
you know, I just I pray every morning for an opportunity. And, and to me, an opportunity is an opportunity to serve, whether that earns me commission or not. Uh, it is uh, an opportunity that I don't take lightly. And I'm very grateful for every opportunity that I'm given to help someone. So I hope you'll either reach out to me. I cover really the state, but Birmingham and Tuscaloosa, primarily Montgomery. Uh, Dixie Tyler, who's in Decatur and Huntsville. Tracy Talley, who's in Huntsville and East Alabama. And Jennifer Redding, who's in Florence, Northwest Alabama. And it's a little tip of Southern Tennessee. So I hope if you have anybody needing care in those areas or anywhere in between that you'll reach out to us. Uh, we'll get started now. We're 10 minutes in. I'm sorry I've taken so long on housekeeping. Please forgive me. Um, we'll get started on the presentation. We've got a couple more people joining. Today we're going to discuss the hospice doula. And I've tagged this as East meets West, because I feel like there's a lot of practices around the world that are in the Eastern, let's say, world uh, around death and dying that are, are centuries old, that it really informed the way that, that hospice is, was both designed and is designed to work now in the United States. Um, and I know you get a lot of presentations on hospice if you're a social worker or nurse needing contact hours. So I hope this is one that maybe is a little bit different slant on something that you, you may know a good bit already about. So we're going to discuss the history of hospice. That's our first objective. Our second objective is to introduce the practice of the hospice doula. And we'll get into that. And we're going to list at least two competencies of that hospice doula. And where I'm going with this really is that the hospice doula and the notion of this amalgamation of Eastern and Western practice is going to lead us today into the doula. And then the doula is going to lead us on Tuesday, March 8th, in sort of backwards into the Eastern practice, where again, we're going to learn to meditate together. And hopefully that'll be a skill that will serve you for many times after uh, the presentation is long since passed. Um, so, the approach to dying should involve a more well-rounded experience as opposed to simply preventing suffering. It means incorporating ideas of comfort, spirituality, support, and acceptance. This is a quote by a Dr. B.J. Miller. Um, he's the executive director of the Zen Hospice Project. If y'all may be familiar with the word Zen, Zen is a school of Buddhism Buddhism was founded in India about 2,500 years ago, and Zen was founded in Japan. Uh, it would be the equivalent of the difference between the Presbyterians, who are Protestants, and the Baptists, who are Protestants. So they're sort of in the same faith, let's say, but they have a little different approach as to whether they sing their songs differently. Let's put it that way. Uh, they sing their songs differently. Thank you, Charity, for putting the, the Survey Monkey uh, uh, address into uh, the chat room for everyone. That was kind of you. I appreciate it. And, and B.J. Miller's comment uh, is in direct uh, opposition to what we see so much so often in the healthcare system, which is this little cartoon I found, which the guy says, you've got six months, but with aggressive treatment, we can make that seem much longer. Um, and, you know, we find so often that hospice is an underutilized benefit that people, particularly doctors, approach everything, I think, because they're trained this way, as a curative. And if admitting death is admitting medical failure. And so they, they are loath many times to call in hospice until it's too late. And the you know, the, what happens then is that uh, the patient suffers greater pain and suffering than would have been the case had they been, you know, had they sought palliative care and spiritual care through hospice. So we'll talk a little bit about the world approach to death and dying, and you'll see maybe links to the way that we approach it. So in Asia, as, as we were just saying, uh, Buddhism is the dominant religion. And I th religion is, a, I'm not sure the right word for Buddhism necessarily, but let's go with it. 
So Buddhism is the largest religion in Asia. And part of being Buddhist is trying to be present at all times. So trying to be lucid. And so in an Eastern culture, if you're working with a Buddhist person at the time of death and dying, they would often refuse pain medication because they would not want to block their ability to be present in the moment and in a sense in the pain part that's sort of part and parcel of their approach as Buddhist to life. Um, and they would also, if they were Buddhist, probably have someone at their side doing meditation or prayer or chants. Uh, there might be offerings in the room, incense, other things, very ritualized, uh, you know, very prescribed uh, supportive way to end your time. Uh, you know, lest we think that, that the United States or the West, the modern world, the industrialized world, uh, you know, has some hold on hospice, we don't. And although I guess Saudi Arabia is the industrialized world, they are in the Eastern world as well, in a sense. But if you require hospice care in Saudi Arabia, there's an entire complex, a, a hospice sort of hospital research center. Anyone needing hospice goes there. So this is anyone in the nation. I mean, that, that's quite an undertaking and quite an offer of Saudi Arabia to approach and to understand the need for hospice work at the time of death as a nation and as a culture. Uh, many times in the Middle East, it, that's sort of the, uh, the, the opposite. In the Middle East, you'll find, and you see this in a lot of uh, what I would call developing countries and nations, you see that the family surrounds the person uh, at death. And not only do they, is it something they do, it's something they're expected to do. It's sort of like awake in a sense. I think in that way, and that you're expected to sit, you know, with your time with the dying and attend to their needs and to be very advocate in, in, in expressing their needs to a physician or to whomever, you know, might come into the space. So, you know, that's a, I think, a very really ancient way of looking at death and dying. Um, and it's one that pervades in many cultures. So if you were to head to the Western US, um, you would find that there are in assisted living, there are a number of group homes. These are residential houses, like might be truly next door to you in your neighborhood where four or five people receive assisted living care. Um, and if you're out there in Arizona or California where they have a proliferation of these, and by this I mean, that it just south of Phoenix in Mesa, they have 2,500 of these. That's just in Mesa, not in Phoenix proper, not in the state of Arizona, just in that town, 2,500 of these residential homes. And the, the high percentage of these homes are run by folks from what I would say are sort of developing nations. So many of the folks who own these homes and manage them are Filipinos. Many of them are Romanians. Many of them are from different uh, African nations, uh, but they're all brought up in a sense with this, this Middle Eastern sense of death and dying, which is you surround the person, you attend to their every need, you're there for them. Um, and to me, that's just so fascinating that that really in the modern industrialized world, we've gotten away from that to where death is something, not only do we, do we not surround people and incorporate it into our lives, we avoid it and avoid discussions of it. Uh, but elsewhere in the world, they're much more sophisticated lest we get too cocky. Um, in Eastern Europe, uh, which is the East, uh, nonetheless, Russian inpatient hospice programs are normal. Now, their first hospice didn't start until 1990. Ours started, I believe, in 74. So that's 16 years later. And yet hospice inpatient programs in the U.S. are certainly the exception and not the rule. For most hospices, an inpatient hospice house is a loss leader. They lose money on that. Uh, there's not enough reimbursement from Medicare to do it. It's truly a service for the community. So hospice inpatient programs, therefore, are out of reach for all but the very, you know, 
best or not best, but the most capitalized hospices. So therefore there are a few of them. Uh, someone, Melissa May says she lived in Saudi Arabia and taking care of their sick or dying is a whole family affair, which includes doctor and nurses. That's so fascinating. Melissa, I'd love to hear more about your time there. Um, in, in Poland, like the rest of the world, it's traditional to, or I say the rest of the world, truly it is most of the world, it's traditional for even friends to join the, the person at the time of death. And I like that. I think that's a sweet notion. And I think friends would like to be involved in some ways, certainly close friends who in some ways may be even closer emotionally to the person than the family member could be. Um, I love that. And Germany is Germany. Um, so very regimented society, very industrialized, very modern, uh, but not a hospice nation. Very few inpatient hospices, very few hospice programs at all, but they are really, they do incorporate much of what hospice does, which is alternative therapies, such as massage or meditation or Reiki or other things. Uh, they try and address the social and spiritual needs of the dying, which is, I think, one of the hallmarks of hospice as practiced in the US under the Medicare benefit. Um, and so, you know, Germany is doing its own thing its own way. Uh, but I think they're addressing hospice in the ways that, that we are. Uh, and then in China, China also regimented. If you're in, in hospice there in an inpatient unit, Thank you, uh, Theodora Kent. Lori, is that Lori? Is Lori your uh, coworker? I hope so. I just let Lori in. Sorry, Lori. I'm sorry for your way. Thank you for joining us. We're just wrapping up our, our history of, not history, but, but sense of a, a sort of world's approach to death and dying as concerns hospice. Um, and... Uh, and so now we're gonna move or continue to sort of look on a macro level at hospice and the history of what we consider hospice, modern hospice in the modern industrialized world. So, um, oh, what I was finishing up, I think saying was in China, if you're in a hospice inpatient uh, facility, there are two beds, one for you and one for the nurse who's expected not to leave your side. So talk about regimented. Um, if we look at the history of hospice and the, and the word hospice, um, then we, we have to look back to um, the medieval times. The word they used was, and I'm gonna bungle the pronunciation, was hospes, I guess, or hospes. Um, it's medieval. Uh, in the 11th century, these hospes or hospes were uh, way stations really for travelers, the indigent for the most part, and they were uh, generally uh, you know, manned by religious orders. Uh, they began in, during uh, the Crusades to proliferate sort of like food trucks do um, on the Crusade battlefields for soldiers that were on their way to or from or lost from their unit. But it, they soon became also sort of ambulatory centers and, uh, you know, centers where, uh, you know, patients were, were being healed. And so uh, that approach, which proliferated and grew during the Crusades as they spread, sort of as the Crusades waned and, and you know, things got back, the, those sort of disappeared. There were some here and there the most prominent of which was resurrected in the 17th century in France by the company of the Daughters of the Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and these ultimately, you know, were, were buildings, you know, structures in which people were cared for and really became the precursor to what France started and the rest of the world followed with hospitals. Um, not much changes in hospice in the Western industrialized world. There's, you know, we're, we're not doing anything until around the 40s. A young woman who was a nurse 
named Cicely Saunders, uh, was working in 1948 with a man who had survived the Warsaw Ghetto. He was Jewish, he had cancer, and he was dying. She fell in love with him, and she comforted him as he lay dying through his death. Um, so she developed, you know, a sense of the dying process because after all, she was in love with this person and she noticed, and she said at the time, as the body becomes weaker, so the spirit becomes stronger. And this is really sort of stunning to me, this statement in a way, if you think about uh, our our waning hours or days and our body becoming weaker, our spirit, instead of retreating, instead of withering, becomes stronger. I love that. In 1967, her ruminations on hospice, later her work as a social worker, she got her social work degree after a back injury. And later in 1957, I believe, became a medical doctor. Uh, opened her hospice in 67. And her abiding principle was Psalm 37, which says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. When her first love died, he bequeathed her about the equivalent of about $30,000, $35,000 at the time. And he said it was for a window in her home. And that window is at the entrance of St. Christopher's Hospice. She later fell in love with another dying person while working in another hospice. So there were other hospices, but these were more in the line of the traditional old world sense of a way station, um, a, just a place for palliation of you know, care, not the full, uh, what she would later come to see is the idea of total pain, not just bodily physical pain, but emotional, social, and spiritual distress or pain. This was the hospice that she opened with St. Christopher's in 1967. And it's based on the care philosophy, again, that you matter because you are you, dying or not. You matter because you are you. You matter to the last moment of your life. And she knew this because she had nursed two Polish gentlemen back to, or not back to health, but through their death. Uh, the second time, it was the one that sort of led her to form the hospice. So a lot of tragedy led her to form this hospice. And I think you see of that with a lot of people that make major contributions in life in any way is they do go through a lot of tragedy. Um, and it's that tragedy that, that is, gives birth to whatever greatness they achieve uh, and they persevere. So that's sort of, the, again, the broad brush stroke of hospice uh, in terms of where we've come from and where we are. Uh, in 1969, some of you may know this book. It's Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published. It's a seminal work called On Death and Dying. Uh, the thing that you may recall from it are the five stages of grief um, you move through you know, sadness and anger, eventually to acceptance. Um, and this was written based on interviews with 500 dying folks. Now, this book changed the way the U.S. looked at death. It was a bestseller. So people then began having discussions about death and dying and their wishes around death and dying, which they'd never had before. So this sort of, you know, rich ground was fertile uh, for Dr. Florence Wald, who in 1974, as the uh, Dean of the Yale School of Nursing, founded the first US hospice, Connecticut Hospice. 
Now, it's still in operation and it is still the standard bearer for hospice in the U.S. I know because I used to sell hospice uh, services up and down the East Coast and Connecticut hospice was, you know, sort of the, the preeminent hospice out there. Um, you'll see Kuba Ross through the, the popularity of her book uh, and she, she, she testified before the, S the Senate, I believe it was, in 1972 uh, about the right to die with dignity and about the right, and this is important, about the right to die at home, okay? Because that's really sort of a hallmark of hospice in some ways, is the right to die at home. Uh, and so that began this process, and you know Washington moves slowly. But it began this process wherein by 1982, a bill passed Congress, which created a benefit in Medicare carved out to pay for hospice. Now, like most bills, it was passed and didn't, didn't take effect until 86. Both of these happened under Reagan, by the way, uh, for those keeping score. I'm not, but some are. Uh, 1982 and 1986. And what that does, that bill requires that, that we incorporate in many ways the total pain of the person and we administer or minister to that total pain, uh, just as, as did Dame Cicely Saunders in founding uh, St. Christopher Hospice, which is to not only palliate uh, the physical pain but also to address the physical, or excuse me, the spiritual and emotional pain. And so hospice requires a, a, a bereavement counselor, it requires that there be grief support. It requires that volunteers administer certain services. Uh, it's required. And this is important to know as we move further into our discussion about doulas, uh, because doulas in hospice are volunteers. So 1987, five years after the hospice benefit was passed, one year after it was became truly law in practice, Dr. B.J. Miller, who we talked about earlier, uh, who is a professor at the University of California of San Francisco School of Medicine, took that total pain idea and said, you know what, we could, we could apply an Eastern process or thought or practice to this total pain. So we're a little bit like the Germans, we're using an alternative therapy here, but we're doing the same thing in a way, or, or we're providing the same care in a way, which is we are now bringing in a, a Buddhist culture and practice like meditative practice or chanting practice or other things into hospice. And the reason this all occurred to B.J. Miller was his own personal story, which contains tragedy. As a freshman, I believe he was at Princeton, as a freshman, he and some classmates were knocking about. I assume the campus was near a train station or train tracks. So he jumps up on a railing to jump over the tracks and grabs onto the wires over his head to steady himself, at which point both of his legs are blown off and he loses one of his arms below the elbow at 18. Tremendous amount of pain, a large number of surgeries. And what he found was A, he found a real passion to become a medical doctor and to work with others who had had a traumatic event. Uh, but he wanted, he found that his, his own ability to heal and cure was through, you know, meditation and Buddhist practice. And as, as we were talking earlier, he's a follower of the Zen school of Buddhism. There are other schools, but let's say he's a Baptist. And, you know, someone else is a Presbyterian and someone else is a Methodist. He's a Baptist Buddhist. Um, and then in 2003, so about 20 years ago now, uh, came the next iteration of an Eastern practice adopted, I think, into, uh, into the hospice practice, which is the death doula. 
this was a fella, Henry Fursco Weiss, who in his 50s decided he would go back to school and become a social worker. And at his first job uh, at New York in New York City at Continuum Hospice, which is also a well-known and respected hospice, at his first job with them, he was given the task of being in charge of volunteers. Well, as he was getting his certification in social work, he had a friend who was getting her certification in being a birth doula. And he said, huh, they compared notes and they realized that they were sort of doing a lot of the same things. Just one of them was applied to end of life and one of them was applied to the birth, the beginning of life. And so he said, you know what? I wonder if we can transpose the doula aspect onto the dying aspect. It's a big transition, just like birth. Maybe it'll work. And as it turns out, it's it's been you know one of the growing uh, things in hospice since. And there are now any number of certifications one can get to be a death doula. The first of which was written by Mr. Weiss. So now I've used the word doula and you may be saying, well, what is this word doula? What does he mean doula? Doula in its very literal definition simply means servant. So this would be a birth servant or a death servant, which harkens back to the notion of these Eastern old idea practices of being attentive and responsive to the dying person and attending to their every need and advocating for them, like you would find in the Middle East, for example, or like you would find in China in a, in a very, you know, to the far right example. Uh, so a doula is just a servant, but a doula in essence is a person who's trained to guide, support, provide education, provide information and provide emotional and physical support and serve as a companion. And this is important. Serve as a companion throughout the rite of passage that is death. And it may also apply to birth. And you may also hear of a postpartum doula. Uh, I, you know, in the South, I think we call these, uh, you know, nannies, but uh, it's someone that comes to the, the young mother just after birth and stays with her through the first couple of weeks just to make sure everything's working. Well, that, you know, the postpartum doula and the, and the, and the, you know, the, the birth doula, these are, these are services you, you pay and, and they're not inexpensive. And death doula, again, this is, this is done by volunteers. So there's no payment. Now you can find certified death doulas who charge, but those who are operating through a hospice do so as part of the hospice benefit. I guess the reason this topic appeals to me is, is really, there are a few reasons, but one of which is that what I feel like Care Patrol does, what I do, is we're sort of a life transition doula. We guide, support, educate, inform, and serve as a companion throughout the rite of passage that is transitioning from one's home to a senior community. So I guess this is appealing to me on many senses, but I also believe that, you know, when I die, I hope that the hospice that I choose has a death doula, provided I have a death that I can foretell and foresee, um, you know, but otherwise, of course, we all have to be prepared to die today, which is what we will discuss later. So the Zen Hospice Project, I want to get back to this a little bit. And again, B.J. Miller, born out of tragedy, uh, a frequent lecturer, someone who gives uh, what are called TED Talks um, and is known for his TED Talk about the Zen Hospice Project and about incorporating a spiritual aspect into the death and dying process. You know, it's his idea that we need to redefine death and palliative care needs to be redefined and incorporate more spirituality uh, so that patients can actually prepare for death, which is a spiritual exercise 
and on their own terms. And of course, he points out, and I think it's true, I think a lot of us are not so worried about dying. We all know that we will die. What concerns us is how we will die, when we will die. Um, and so, you know, I think he's, he's right on with that statement. And again, he, he continues to hit the notion throughout his talks and writings and, and lectures that the approach to dying should be more well-rounded, shouldn't simply be about preventing suffering, should be about acceptance of death by the dying person and spirituality of the dying person at that time. So the Zen Hospice Project is a guest house. It ha it, it, there's a center, so there are other activities and administrative activities that take place with it, but it is an inpatient hospice center with six beds. Um, and it offers a different inpatient hospice experience because it incorporates more of what I mentioned would be at the bed of a Buddhist in Asia, which would be, there would be most likely meditative, you know, meditations, perhaps guided meditations, perhaps reading certain text or chanting certain, you know, well-worn chants, burning incense, you know, having massage or, or these sorts of things. So this is a, a, a more of a spiritual approach than the typical inpatient unit, which while, it, you know, much better than a clinical sterile uh, hospital death uh, is still, you know, you know, not as, as not, not, not as in spirit, not as in experience. And, and I guess his, his guiding principle is, you know, just imagine if we live in a world where we supported death, talked about death and uh, you know, we're prepared for death and that it was the cornerstone of our caregiving model uh, that we would take care of people, not only at death, but live life more fully because we have a better concept of death. Um, and he says, and I think this is a question all of us can ask and, and probably should ask. And we've talked about, you know, different planning scenarios, different things in the last six weeks or, you know, so. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we do need to think about doing is planning our uh, planning for our own death, having our wills written, our DNR orders, other things. And as we're doing that, I think we want to ask the question that B.J. Miller asked, which is, at the end of our lives, what do we most wish for? I mean, that's a sobering question, isn't it? At the end of our lives, what do we most wish for? Ask yourselves that. I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself that. I'm a little stuck, frankly. Henry Fursco Weiss, uh, this is again a, a fellow that in his 50s felt a need and a calling to be a social worker. It wasn't his first profession uh, and had a coincidental experience with a, a friend who was a birth doula. Um, and uh, was a birth doula and uh, wraps the idea of the birth doula, the education, the information, the transitional experience and handholding wrapped that around the dying process. And the reason was when he first started working at Continuum Hospice as a social worker, he would hear stories from families who were um, you know, either not there at the death of their loved one or uh, you know there was there were decisions made, hospitalizations or other things that were against their wishes, or uh, they may have made decisions to hospitalize or seek treatments or not seek treatments that they, in retrospect, felt was the wrong decision. So he was learning firsthand all of the ways in which this hospice process design was not meeting the needs of all of the people who were on it. I mean, it was no fault of the hospice. It was just that there was a, still a missing piece, which was, in his mind, the doula. 
So he started the first doula course in 2003 with 17 volunteers. And again, the hospice benefit per Medicare has to include, include excuse me, so much care that's hands-on by a volunteer. So this perfectly meets the hospice benefit need and it perfectly meets the need of the hospice patient. What he was looking for in volunteers and what others could look for in volunteers were not people that were nurses, social workers, you know, phlebotomists, or, you know, somehow in the field, but instead people that had had profound experiences around death, bad or good, if bad that they wanted to help other people not have, or if good that they wanted to try and help other people to have those good experiences. So 17 people said, yeah, I'm, I'm on board for this. They were trained over six weeks, I think, 22 hours. Um, and it, it had them not only look outwardly at what they were doing for the persons whom they were entrusted, but also to understand and come to grips with their own sense of death and dying. So they could be a more powerful and steady advocate for those people than might be the case otherwise. Um, and so ideally the people that are, would receive a doula would be open and comfortable around addressing issues of death um, and, or if a family or a person had limited support a doula would be proper. And a doula, again, is going to take someone through the process of dying from the moment that the hospice engages them to do a lot of the things that hospice intends, like talk and listen to the dying patient and try and help their needs be voiced and try and help them do things like create a bucket list and get it done, or uh, to make amends with an estranged family member, or uh, to make a trip one last time to a special place. So a doula could incorporate all of that, as well as getting closer to the time of death, a doula could prevent someone or at least educate them about the consequences of not doing this treatment or doing this treatment or going to the hospital or not going to the hospital or having a good experience or not having a good experience. The doula could ensure that people have an informed guide to take them through the death experience. So that is the role of the doula. To my knowledge, it is not employed in Alabama by any hospice of which I'm aware. It is still a burgeoning practice, but it's one that I have great faith in. And I do believe that over time, the hospice doula will become a more utilized uh, service in hospice and that hospice doulas will become greater in number because more people with exposure will want to volunteer to make sure that that process, that most important process of dying is not bittersweet for the person and the family left behind. So what services does a death doula provide to the patient? Well, they work to comfort them and coordinate legacy activities. And what that would mean would be What's going to happen to your bank account? What's going to happen to the power bill? What's going to happen, uh, you know, to uh, the, the stocks? What's going to happen to the 401k? So someone that could take a lot of paperwork and paper trail off a person and coordinate certain activities, as well as comfort them just in the general sense, whether that's reading them a poem or looking out the window together or playing cards, whatever it might be. They might and generally do, and certainly at the Zen Hospice Project, certainly do use anxiety reducing techniques like visualization, which can be very effective in reducing pain, or meditation, or massage, or Reiki, or other non traditional Eastern or just simply non traditional practices. Uh, they would discuss end of life wishes with the person. So, what does that look like for you? 
How would you like the last minutes of your life to be? Uh, what do you envision for yourself? And just like so many other things in terms of setting up our DNRs and, and our wills and our powers of attorney, this allows us to instruct others what we want to happen. Um, now it's listening and actively listening, which is, you know, not trying to think about what you're going to say next, but actually hearing what they're saying and then asking clarifying questions and getting more to the point. So that this person who's dying feels that they really have made their point. Um, they may also do things like, you know, the room. So again, the Zen hospice project, this would be something they would be very fluent in would be, you know, having candles and pillows and nice smelling things around. Uh, there would be a lot of, you know, possibly reading and companionship uh, and, you know, also information shared with the family that keeps them informed, uh, that keeps them on board and knowing what the wishes are of the dying person, particularly if there's some tension around that. So those are some of the services uh, that a doula would provide. Now, reading and providing comfort to me is interesting. This is the role that I would envision a doula playing, certainly at the end of life. And it's the role that I envisioned for myself with Birmingham AIDS Outreach about 25 years ago. They needed volunteers to sit with the dying. And I was going to volunteer. Uh, long story, I ended up not being able to do it. But um, Nonetheless, I assume we'd be reading the book, a book with each other. But, you know, in Tibet, uh, there's a book called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, or Tibetan Book of the Dead, rather. Uh, and they actually, the Tibetan monks will read that book to the dying person. And even after they've died, they'll continue reading that book because it provides essentially a roadmap for the next life in their eyes. Um, and so it's a very important way to communicate with someone. And they, they, it's really a 48 hour process in which they read and chant and meditate and try and guide the spirit into the next place. Um, and then we have, there's, a, there's uh, as you would expect now, as something 20 years old, there's a national end of life doula alliance. As I said earlier, there are quite a number of certifications available. You can simply Google end of life doula and there's a whole host of things that will pop up for you. One of those is Mr. Weiss's, but there are many, many others and most of them incorporate his approach. Uh, but so the competencies that they suggest that end of life doula should have would be patient and family advocacy, uh, obviously cultivating community relationships, which means resources, if the dying person needs a new roof, you need to know a roofer. Uh, active listening, critical resolution. So if there are family dynamic issues, and there almost always are, you need to have the ability to negotiate those. Uh, you did not miss the key word. I didn't put it, I don't think, but the key word is doula, D-O-U-L-A, capital D. Olympia Clopton asked that I missed the key word I'm on via phone, so everything is small, key. Uh, it is CU code word or password is doula, and that's spelled capital D-O-U-L-A. Thank you, Olympia, for bringing that to my attention. I, I apologize to those of you uh, who were, uh, were, you know, missing it. Uh, Creative problem solving is a, a communication competency. Uh, and this could be, you know, in, in, a, in a hospital where you have a nurse who's insisting on doing X and, and the doula maybe says, well, the patient doesn't want X. Uh, professionalism, I mean, I think that would be a competency in any vocation. It certainly is in social work and nursing and, and what I do. Uh, but the thing that's important here is self-care. So you would expect that, if you're having these profound experiences on a regular basis, uh, that you would need some type of self-care, some way to unwind from it, or else I think it would be more than you could ultimately understand. The doula needs to know the Medicare COP certificates of participation. Uh, she needs to have uh, skills and development in other ways, and of course needs to maintain confidentiality that would be true in HIPAA as in anything. 
knowledge. She needs to have support knowledge. She needs to have the system to make referrals, roles and responsibilities and legal and medical knowledge. There's a lot you're asking of volunteers, uh, but uh, these are the competencies nonetheless. And the people who do it as volunteers are very passionate and are very happy to keep to these competencies. There's a doula model of care that they all learn. Um, there are some, some physiological and spiritual dimensions to care that they learn. Uh, and they learn cultural humility. And this is my favorite, one of my favorite things. Remember we talked earlier about how different cultures approach death and dying differently. So in some cultures, they rally around the bed and are very you know uh, vocal and vocal advocates. And, and so you might need to just understand, hey, this Palestinian family that I'm helping I need to take a step back here and be respectful and not overstep. And so you need to have cultural sensitivity and accountability and you need to understand personal boundaries uh, when it comes to death and dying. It's a very personal space. Uh, and so these are the core competencies of, uh, of uh, the doula uh, sort of, uh, these are just some other names that you might Google. Uh, and there are home funeral guides. I found this out. So there are people doing sort of advocacy or work in all sorts of fields. There's care patrol, which is transition work. There are people who are funeral guides um, about home funerals. Now, I don't really know what a home funeral is unless it's a wake. I, I know there's nobody who's burying their dad in their backyard. But I, there's something to it, and certainly it might be worth a Google search. Uh, and then, but the end of life doula, you, they're called midwives. And sometimes people know the doula by that word, the midwife, um, or the death midwife, the death doula, uh, midwife to the soul, the pre death guide. Here's my favorite one psycho pop. I don't even know what that means. Sacred crossings guide. Um, so, you know, those are just some different names for it. I hope that today we've covered enough about the death doula for you to begin to have some appreciation for the practice, some knowledge of what it is to be a doula and what it means to be a end of life doula, a sense of the core competencies of the end of life doulas and what they do for others and how these incorporate a world approach or an underdeveloped world approach, Eastern approach to death and dying into a very modern Western US approach of death and dying, which is hospice work. Um, so again, the CEU code word is doula and that's capital D-O-U-L-A. You'll receive your certificate tonight or tomorrow. Please complete Survey Monkey by five o'clock today. Uh, the Survey Monkey address for those who need it is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash r, that's a lowercase r, forward slash uppercase z, uppercase z, uppercase q, uppercase b as in boy, six, K uppercase, uppercase D is in David. So that's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash R forward slash ZZQB6KD. Please complete those surveys on Survey Monkey today by five. I'll get your certificates out by mail tonight or, or by email rather tonight or tomorrow. Please complete all the questions, particularly the one about how I can improve or do a better job. And also any other, you know, if you have any ideas for presentations, I'm trying to really work with those ideas. So this month, I believe everything we're doing with the exception of the first two are suggestions from y'all. So if we can keep those going, I know then that I'm educating you about what you wanna be educated about um, and then um, we could, uh, I'm sorry, I was just reading uh, uh, Melissa Brewer's comments and it just caught my attention. I was a hospice social worker for 15 years 
in Tennessee had a patient that was buried on his property. You had to go through a legal process to get approval. Very interesting situation. Yes, it is. I would not want my dad on my backyard. I don't even really like my dogs back there. Uh, it's just, I don't know. Although I do like cemeteries, so who knows? Uh, maybe you should get one of those old woodmen of the world, uh, odalisk. That would be good. Uh, so thank you all for listening in. Again, we're Care Patrol. We appreciate your referrals. That's how we stay in business. Uh, we'd love for you to refer anyone that's needing guidance, education, information, all free around senior care and options. And certainly then if they move into a community or use a sitter that we recommend, then we're paid a commission and that's how we earn a living. Uh, so thank you for your referrals. Thank you for listening in. Please ask your friends and colleagues to join us in the future. Uh, and always, always reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, and also referrals. Thanks so much. Y'all have a great day and uh, we'll see you soon. Well, I thought I was ending y'all. Thank you and have a good evening. Oh, darn it. <laughs>